Hello. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Hello, hello, hello. We are here. Yes, 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 we are here. Yes, 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 Charlene is here. Hi, Charlene. We are here. Yes, we are. We are sleepy, but here. Long day, long week, and it's only Tuesday. <laughs> but nevertheless, we are here. We are here. I will give it a little bit more than a minute, and then we'll get started. We're going to make it through. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, we are. Ooh. I need to go to bed after this, guys. I'm hitting the sack. Try to catch me, I don't know, six hours, which is amazing. If I could catch six hours, that's amazing. So we're going to try to catch six hours. I can't remember last time I had eight hours. So I'm not even going to lie to myself, but six hours would be amazing right now. Absolutely amazing. Yes. That is good. We'll give it about 15 more seconds. Yes, I got the sleepies, girl. I got the yannies and the sleepies, and it's contagious. But once I start talking, we'll be good. I promise. Hi, Juan. Once I get into it, I'm usually good. So let's get started. But we are going through the New Testament in a year. We are in Matthew. Uh, we all know Matthew was a tax collector, right? Uh, and we have been reading his um, account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are, yesterday we were in the woes and we had eight woes, right? Uh, and uh, we are moving on today, moving that much closer to the crucifixion of our Lord. Um, this particular uh, chapter, however, Jesus is talking about the end times. And so um, we're going to get started with this. So he's leaving the temple after telling all of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, all of these woes, right? Uh, and the Bible says here that he left the temple um, and this was like a final leaving of the temple, guys. So uh, when he leaves the temple this time, Oh, it's you and Lene. Hi, Lene. When he leaves the temple this time, he is not coming back. So this is uh, Jesus' last time in the temple. And so, you know, it's been a very difficult time. The uh, disciples have had to listen to all of these woes that have gone forth. And so, you know, now they're calling his attention to the temple and, and basically, you know, look at the beauty of the temple, Lord. Um, and Jesus looks at the temple and says, mm, well, I tell you the truth, uh, actually the temple is coming down and, you know, stone by stone, it's going to be taken apart. It's basically what he says. If you look at verse two, he says, do you see all these things? He asked, truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every uh, every one will be thrown down. And he's talking about the temple. And so let's talk about this temple. So you may remember that uh, uh, the temple that Solomon originally built, that the Babylonians uh, destroyed that temple and burnt it to the ground, right? And then the temple was rebuilt. Um, uh, in the days of uh, Zerubbabel, right? Uh, uh, the temple was rebuilt um, and we read a lot of the prophets, the minor prophets that had their hands in rebuilding that temple. Uh, but remember when the temple was rebuilt, um, uh, the elders that saw the rebuilt temple uh, actually cried, right? They cried because it did not have the glory of the former Solomon's temple. 
And so since it did not have the glory, it was not as big and it didn't have uh, as many uh, customations, I would say, as the former temple did. And so they actually cried. But um, in uh, Jesus' time, King Herod, who was the king when Jesus was born, actually spent some time. Um, um, uh, I read in one commentary, it says he spent 80 years actually revamping the Jewish temple. And so uh, he was trying to get it um, uh, to a certain state of glory. So, of course, he could take uh, uh, credit for getting it to that state of glory. Uh, but they said he spent 80 years adding additions and uh, really beautifying the temple. Um, and history um, and legacy says that there was gold in between like each uh, layer of brick was like a layer of gold, right? Um, and when Jesus says here that there will not be one stone left on another, um, that's sort of signifying that when that temple came down um, 40 years after Jesus said this, so it was uh, AD 40 when the temple came, I mean, AD 70, when the temple came down and the Roman Empire destroyed the temple. When the temple came down, um, the Bible says the Romans wanted to get the gold so bad that they actually took time to sort of level the temple first. Um, and then like row by row, they would take off the stones so they could get to go, get the gold. And so it's very significant here that Jesus was saying that one stone would not be left on top of another, right? Um, because it was meticulously uh, dismantled, if you would, in order to get all of the gold that was put in that temple. So Jesus having a, a prophetic moment in this chapter, he's prophesying uh, uh, forward lots of things. But this first prophecy, most theologians believe that is talking about AD 70 when, I'm, when Jesus uh, uh, is prophesying here, he's talking about when the Romans actually destroyed the temple. And this actually scattered the Jews um, uh, when the Romans destroyed the temple, it was over 2,000 years before the Jews ever came back as a nation. Um, um, in 1948, there was a great uh, coming back to Judaism, and they all gathered again. But this was the beginning of that scattering process um, um, right here when the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And Jesus prophesied about it. But Jesus goes on to prophesy about way more than this temple destruction uh, in this uh, chapter. So he starts off um, uh, moving from there in verse three, um, talking on the Mount uh, of Olives, right? Um, and the disciples started all off just by asking them a question. And I'm sure they may have thought, this is just a simple question, Lord. I'm just going to ask you this simple little thing. Can you answer? And Jesus sort of uh, goes on a, a, a long discourse um, in the answering of their questions, but a very important discourse for us. Um, it says in verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so the disciples thought this was all one question, right? Whenever the temple is going to be destroyed, that also means, must be um, the time of your coming and the coming of age. They did not understand. These were two different uh, answers, right? The temple will be des destroyed uh, 40 years from, from this writing, right? Um, they didn't understand that when would be the coming of Jesus um, was a whole different conversation, right? And so Jesus begins to answer that question um, um, about his uh, the signs of the time first, and then he answers about uh, his coming. He says in verse... Uh, 
Let's see. Let's continue in verse three. Uh, no, sorry, verse four. Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. So the first thing that Jesus wants to establish is that many are going to come. False prophets are going to come, right? Um, and he's telling them not only will false prophets come uh, speaking in my name, but you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. Um, but don't let that alarm you, right? Nation is going to rise against nation and kingdom is going to rise against kingdom. But let, don't let that worry you. Uh, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains, right? The beginning of birth pains. And so Jesus is saying, when you have seen these things, no, it's starting. Like birthing is happening. It's, 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 it's priming up for it, right? Um, and I think we all can agree that we've seen all this before, right? This is not the sign of Jesus coming, but it is a sort of a look uh, for us into the beginnings of of uh sort of this uh eschatol eschatological or the end times right uh things actually happening and so um you hear wars and rumors of wars and nations against one another uh you know that something's happening now a lot of people have preached that that means the end times are here. When you hear of, you know, nation against nation and kingdoms against kingdoms, but Jesus didn't say that that means the end times are here. He says this is the beginning of the birth pains. And just like any woman who has had birth pains, you know, they start off small and a long way apart, right? Um, but the more birth pains you have, the closer they get together, right? Your contractions start contracting more and more as the baby is getting more and more ready to be delivered. That's the same thing Jesus is comparing this to. It's going to start off like few and far between, but as the time gets closer for me to come, you're going to start seeing these things more regularly now. Think about what have we seen more regularly? We're seeing all kinds of natural disasters more regularly. We're seeing earthquakes and we're seeing tornadoes and typhoons. And, you know, they got all kinds of different names. They actually named them because we're seeing them so repetitively. And so uh, we have to understand that the trigger of uh of the end times is coming has already been triggered right the birth pains have started um then in verse nine it says then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death right so the, the first birth pain that sort of gets us to the fact that oh the end times may be coming um is sort of all of that natural disaster stuff that we will see happening more and more but the second sign is that you're going to be persecuted like as a christian it is no longer going to be popular to be christian and people are going to begin to persecute christianity right that's how you know it's a sign of the end times well is that already happening right people are persecuting Christianity already, and even the more so um, as we get closer and closer to the times, right? Listen to what he says. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And so it's coming a time where people are going to be persecuted, right? Uh, but some of those persecutions aren't going to end, right, with people keeping their faith, right? So there's going to be a lot of persecutions. A lot of people are going to be put to death. Um, you're going to be hated by everybody. All the nations are going to hate you. Um, and many are going to turn away. Many are going to turn away. 
and not and if they don't turn away then they're gonna stay in house but they just gonna be fighting amongst each other right and so jesus kind of laying out a picture of what will happen um um and that you need to watch for these things right and so not only are you watching um the you know uh, sort of the, the natural disasters that happen and, and at what rate are we having natural disasters happen um, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, to us at this time. Uh, but you also need to look at uh, the persecutions and how many people are turning away from the faith and how many people are shunning Christianity. And if you think about it, hey, Tanya, if you think about it, uh, people are turning away from the faith um, based on things that aren't really uh, correct. People are, are misrepresenting the faith. Uh, we have uh, a whole population of our faith that's standing um, uh, with number 45, which is causing a lot of people to say, see, if they agree with number 45, then I can't, if that's what Christians are, then I don't want to have anything to do with that, right? People are turning away from the faith, right? Because, you know, uh, Christians are intolerant and, you know, all of these labels that they give to us as they accuse us of giving labels, right? And so we have to uh, put on our uh, discerning eyes so that we can really see what's going on. And Bishop talked a lot about discernment on Sunday and uh, what we need to do to make sure that we're looking with a discerning eye. Um, uh, this is a very important scripture though. Verse 13 says, um, uh, well, let's start with verse 12. Verse 12 says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. I'm going to read that one again. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And so people aren't going to care about each other, right? Wickedness is going to be so rampant in our land that people aren't going to care about each other. Their hearts are going to grow cold. They're not going to have empathetic uh, which is what we teach, right? It's important that you have empathy. They're going to be whatever the opposite of empathy is, right? Their hearts are going to be cold and callous. They're not going to care about people. Um, um, and why? Because wickedness is running rampant in the land. Um, and because of that, uh, uh, all the wickedness that's in the land is going to cause people to not even care about one another. They're just going to care about the next wicked thing that they can do and um, uh, not even consider how those wicked things affect people. They're just going to continue in that cycle of wickedness. Um, but listen at verse 13. But the one who stands firm till the end will be saved right and then he goes on to talk about uh and it's important that you turn that you stand fast to the end uh, uh, especially in what he talks about after this right he talks about uh the gospel being preached to all the nation i've heard her preachers say jesus can't come until the gospel is preached to all the nation and that's the sign right and although that is just like the natural disasters just like the persecution just like the false prophets those are the birthing pains right and preaching to all the nations is a a, a part of that process but the real sign that jesus is is coming that second coming is found in verse 15. Um, and he says, out of all the other things he calls that all pre-work, but the real sign is found in um, uh, Matthew 24, 15. And it says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it would be in those days for pregnant women 
and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, right? For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, even if it was possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. Um, so basically here, this scripture is telling us that the true sign is the abomination of desolation. Now, you may not have been with me in the book of Daniel where we talked about this, and we're definitely going to talk about it more in the book of Revelation. But this abomination of desolation is when uh, uh, the Antichrist will sit on the throne uh, that is in the temple of Jerusalem and call himself God, right? Call himself God. And it's the abomination of desolation. Um, and uh, the temple, however, um, hopefully most of you know that right now there is no Jewish temple in existence, right? Um, so what does that mean, right? A lot of people have theorized that this quote unquote already happened and it happened with that temple that was built uh by Zerubbabel right and and those that built it then um and expanded on by King Herod but it doesn't make sense if you compare this with scriptures in Daniel with scriptures in Revelation that Jesus was talking about that temple when he was talking about the abomination of desolation. It makes more sense to see as two separate things, that temple being destroyed, and then there would be another temple where the abomination of desolation will be set up. So there is a future time. Jesus is prophesying of a time even past us right now, a future time where the temple of the Jewish people will be rebuilt. And when that rebuilding happens, there will be the uh, a person who is the Antichrist, who is going to claim to be Jesus and is going to sit on the throne in the newly built temple. And Jewish people are going to recognize him as the Messiah. And that is going to be the abomination of desolation. And Jesus says, when you see that, then you will know that I'm on my way. And Daniel actually gave it a time frame. He said 1,290 days, which um, uh, theologians have mapped out to be about three and a half years. So three and a half years from the time of the abomination of desolation. When you see that three and a half years from that time, uh, Jesus is going to come, right, is what Daniel says. Uh, and, and remember, he talks about the 70 weeks and the 1290 days and all of that. Um, and Jesus said, listen, if they tell you it's me, don't believe. If people are telling you, come run over here and see Jesus or come run over here and see Jesus, don't believe it. Jesus says, when I come, it's going to be like lightning. It's going to strike in the east and be seen in the west. And so what does that mean? That means when Jesus comes, everyone is going to be able to see him all at once. Hear me again. When Jesus comes, everyone is going to be able to see him all at once. He said, don't be fooled by people having you run over here. Oh, he's over here at this church. Come see Jesus. Oh, he's over here in the synagogue. Come, He's in the newly built temple. Come see Jesus. Do not believe what people say about that. Jesus said, when I come, it's going to be like lightning, right? That starts in one place and goes to another, but it is seen everywhere. So Jesus is is uh, definitely his return is going to be seen everywhere. Then uh, we go on from here. There's lots of different, um, and uh, we'll probably talk about it in great detail in Revelation and backtrack a bit and even reference some scriptures, but there's lots of theories about what happens, right? So um, um, a lot of people believe um, that there's a pre 
uh, you know, tribulation. So that period of those weeks is, is called the tribulation period, that three and a half years. And a lot of people believe in pre-tribulation rapture. Um, a lot of people believe in mid-tribulation rapture. And some people believe in post-tribulation rapture. Um, and it just it all depends on the belief. We really don't know, right? Um, but the Bible does speak of, and, and we read it here, where it says uh, two women are going to be grinding and one's going to be taken and one left, right? Two men are going to be in the field and one's going to be taken and one is left. What does that mean? We call that the rapture. The word rapture does not appear in the Bible. This is just the term that uh, Christians have agreed to use uh, to talk about this time when Jesus is going to... Uh, uh, catch up the saints into the sky, right? And all of a sudden, if you're a saint, uh, to those who ain't, you gonna disappear, right? Um, and so most people um, would love to believe in the pre-tribulation, right? Because it makes sense, right? Pre-tribulation, right? So before this tribulation starts with this whole three and a half year process with the abomination of tribulation and the whole mark of the beast thing that we've heard of, all that, before any of that starts, Jesus is going to catch me up in the sky, right? Which is what some people believe. However, there are others that say, hey, uh, who says that the church is not going to have to go through persecution, right? And so uh, it does not necessarily mean because this is a trying time that the church is going to be gone right away. And so perhaps uh, it's going to start with the church there, but then halfway through, God is going to take them, right? Uh, so those are the people who believe in mid-tribulation. Then there are some people who believe in post-tribulation, who believe that the church is going to go through all of everything, right? Uh, all the way up to the end. And then Jesus is going to catch us up, in the, uh, up into the sky at that point. Um, I am a believer in we don't know, right? Um, and rather try to ascribe uh, to something that is not specifically stated in the word of God. I think it's just uh, uh, be ready is the key. Like, be ready. Like Jesus says in this passage of scripture about three or four times, no man knows the day or the hour that I'm going to come. Only the father has that information, right? The angels don't know it. Jesus doesn't know it, right? And so we need to just be ready. And that's the message. I think we spend far too much time trying to pinpoint it down. There have been people who thought they have pinpointed down, uh, pinpointed it down. They have announced, right, to the whole public, Jesus is coming back on this day. And then they've been embarrassed uh, because and had to backtrack and figure out what else they could say because Jesus did not come on the day they told everybody that he would be there. It's important for us not to even get caught up in pre-tribulation or mid-tribulation or post-tribulation, what's most important for us is that no matter where we are in the process, that we're ready. And I think a lot of times people concentrate on when is Jesus coming, right? And not on that, will I be ready, right? Will you be ready? That's the most important thing. Are you ready? We don't even, uh, uh, as, as a whole body of Christ, preach even those sermons that says, Jesus is coming back, right? Jesus is coming back. Uh, it's amazing because uh, I probably heard this almost every Sunday um, um, when I was growing up because you can talk about the old pastors in the Baptist way, right? But they always took it to the cross at the end um, to let you know that early, right? Early uh, that in the morning he rose, right? Uh, they let you know he died and he rose and they let you know that he was coming again. We have more songs even uh, in the uh, uh, days of old, I will say, um, that positioned us to be in a mind frame that Jesus is coming back, right? Um, we have to be careful that we're ready, that we don't become so satisfied with this world, that we don't come so, become so engulfed 
in this world that we don't uh, become uh, status quo in this world and forget that there is a higher purpose for our lives that doesn't end here, that there is a higher purpose for our lives that uh, 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 is heavenly bound. Uh, we used to sing songs, this world is not my home. I'm just passing by. My home, you know my treasure. All lies up there, right? It doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, make sense for me to even feel at home in this world anymore i can't i can't feel at home in this world anymore that's what we used to sing um nowadays i think people have gotten pretty satisfied uh and are trying to make this world even more and more comfortable for them um uh, because uh they're setting up shop thinking that this world isn't going anywhere but be not deceived right don't be deceived god is coming back um, and I know you've been hearing probably from your grandmother's grandmother that, you know, it's almost time, right? The time is getting short and all of that. And, and because you've heard it so much, you may be thinking that uh, you can put off some things for a little while long because I'm not sure when exactly Jesus is coming for me. No, Jesus says in this scripture, like a thief in the night, right? Just like a thief. Uh, comes in and uh, nobody even knows he's there. That's how Jesus is going to come like a thief. It's going to be quick, right? And you've got to be ready. So important that you be ready. So I behoove you. I admonish you. I beseech you. I beg of you that you really begin to live your Christian life Every day, like Jesus could come the next second. What would it be like if all of us led our lives daily like Jesus could come the next second? Like the next second, the next second, the next second, the next second, Jesus could come. What would it be like if be like if that's really what we did every day and how we lived out our life every day? That is really what's the requirement. You should always be looking forward. You should be like Paul. You should be able to say to live is Christ, but to die is gain. You should be excited um, uh, to see him one day. And if that's not you, then it could be that you have become too content in this world, right? Um, I, I am a firm believer that a lot of things that happen to us is uh, happening uh, God's way of reminding us that, you know, this world is not all uh, uh, sugar plums, right? Um, uh, it can hit you hard. And I think it's not until the world hits you hard that you realize, um, hey, this world really isn't my home. I mean, it really isn't my home. So it's important that you realize that. Uh, then this uh, ends with a parable um, about two different sons. Um, and it talks about uh, uh, two different scenarios, right? In the first scenario, uh, he talks about uh, the faithful and the wise servant. I called it a son, but a servant. The faithful and the wise servant servant who had um the master has put over his servants and then the master goes away and so he finds one servant and says you know watch these while i'm going i'll be right back right um and the servant um that he asked to watch right um he says it's going to be good for that servant when the master comes back if the master finds them doing what he said to be done, right? That is what's going to be best for that servant. But then there's another servant over here who is asked to do something, right? Um, and he's asked to look over the same thing, same scenario, asked to look over the, the master's servants until the master returns, right? But 
and he thinks the master is just going to take too long and he starts thinking like i need to take things into my own hands because there's no telling when the master is coming back and because of that he begins to treat the servants wrong um and even kill them right um uh, because he think he got all this time uh before the master returns but then the master returns and deals with that servant right um the bible says he cut him into pieces that's what the bible says i didn't make i didn't make it up it says he cut him into pieces look at verse uh 51 he cut him into pieces and assigned him a place with the hypocrites right um it's important that we understand that while we are waiting on Jesus, we're not supposed to be down here twiddling our thumbs and saying, oh, well, I don't know when Jesus is going to come back, so I can just do whatever, right? Uh, no, no, no. Blessed is the man that Jesus finds doing. In other words, Jesus left assignments for us all. Blessed is the man that Jesus finds doing. So it's not enough for you to just be sitting around, right? Uh, mediocre, lackadaisical, right? But it's also not enough for you to think that you got so much time. So I'm going to go run off and do this right quick because I got time to get back. Uh, we don't know that we have time to get back. We don't know that we have time to get back. We don't know that we have time to get back. I suggest you not leave, right? Because you don't know if you have time to get back. So uh, Jesus ends uh, uh, sort of that discourse there um, talking about those two servants. Um, and of course, we want to be the servant that is found doing when Jesus returns. Um, we are going to close it up there. And uh, tomorrow, we're going to be talking about some very familiar passages. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, the 10 uh, versions, which is a very familiar passage of scripture, uh, but we're going to go on from there and talk about other parables of Jesus Christ. So hopefully you are doing the reading yourself so that the rhema word will get into your heart that the Lord wants to place there. So read the word for yourself is very important. But until next time, you be blessed and know that God loves you and I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen.